Hello, everyone. I'm Amjad Ahmed, Chairman of the Empower Middle East Initiative at the Atlantic Council. With great pleasure, I welcome you all to the Wind Fellowship UAE launch event. When we developed the Wind Fellowship nearly two years ago, it aligned with our vision to catalyze change for growth and prosperity in the Middle East. And what better way to do so than to enable talented women to accelerate their networks, knowledge, and businesses while driving policies and programs that matter most to leveling the playing field. Our discussion today revolves around a crucially important subject, the role of women in venture funding within the UAE. This is a country where an impressive 70% of all university graduates are women. Yet we grapple with a significant gender gap in startup activity. According to the Global Entrepreneurship Report, in the United Arab Emirates, only two women for every five men are participating in starting a business. But let's not forget, Despite these numbers, the UAE is a regional leader in gender equality, according to the Global Gender Gap Report. While this progress is noteworthy, it also emphasizes the need to promote further representation and opportunities for women in venture capital and entrepreneurship. Most importantly, we must foster more women in venture capital and private equity to fund more women-led startups and businesses. We are fortunate to have an exceptional panel of industry leaders and experts who will share their insights and experiences on the topic. Through our discussion, we hope to evaluate existing challenges, examine the transformative impact of women-specific programs, and explore strategies for boosting female participation and leadership in venture and growth capital. Before we begin, I wanna thank our sponsors, the US Embassy in the UAE, whose support has been instrumental in making this program a reality. I also thank ADGM for being an invaluable in-country partner and our panelists for sharing their time and wisdom. I want to also acknowledge our educational partner, Georgetown University, who has been with us since the inception of this program. Finally, I appreciate all the Wind Fellows joining us today who took the brave step to apply and accept the challenge of this rigorous one-year program. Before we begin the panel discussion, we are fortunate to have two keynote speakers with us today. First, I invite Dalia Udin, Head of Public Affairs and Outreach U.S. Embassy to the UAE for her opening remarks. Dalia joined the U.S. Consulate General in Dubai as the Public Affairs Officer in July 2022. Previously, she served as Acting Deputy Economic Chief at the U.S. Mission to the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, and as the Budget and Oversight Officer at the U.S. Mission to the Rome-based U.N. and international organizations, overseeing U.S. contribution flows of over $2 billion a year. Welcome, Dahlia. The floor is yours. Hello, Sarah, everyone. Um, I'm thrilled to be here to open the first Win Fellowship launch event in the UAE on venture funding evaluating the gender gap and the role of women's specific programs. And also thank you to the Abu Dhabi Global Market for hosting us all in your beautiful venue. We are honored to have the UAE Ambassador to the United States, Ambassador Oteba, provide opening remarks for this critical discussion. And to all of the Wynn Fellows here today and those joining online, congratulations for being part of the first Empower Me Wynn Fellowship cohort in the UAE. You are role models for all women entrepreneurs in the U.S. and across the world. Mabruk. The U.S. mission to the UAE is very excited to support the Atlantic Council Empower Me Win Fellowship in collaboration with Georgetown Business School for the first time here in the UAE. Our support for this program is rooted in our Partners for the Future initiatives here in the UAE with our partners here to encourage innovation and sustainable growth. As a graduate of a historic women's college in the United States, I know firsthand how impactful programs that target women leaders can be. Women's access to venture capital is a challenge worldwide, but when women are empowered economically, they invest in their families, communities, spur economic growth, and create more stable societies. By evaluating the effectiveness of funding programs specifically designed for women entrepreneurs and the extent to which they create broader opportunities in the community, we will be able to assess whether women are gaining an equitable share of available funding. Addressing this gender gap is just the first step in creating a more equitable society for women where they're empowered to make changes within their communities. Tonight's event is just the beginning of the journey for our WIN Fellows. 
We will look forward to seeing you develop the skills and motivation needed to take your businesses to the next level. We hope to showcase your journey and accomplishments throughout the year, including at COP28 and UAE Innovation Month in February. Thank you again to the Abu Dhabi Global Market, the UAE Embassy in Washington, Atlantic Council, and Georgetown for putting together such a dynamic panel of speakers. I'm excited to hear about their insights on improving women's access to venture capital, and I encourage all of our fellows to engage in a lively discussion with our speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dalia, for being with us and supporting the Wind Fellowship. Uh, and now it gives me great pleasure to welcome His Excellency Yusuf al Oteba, Ambassador of the United Arab Emirates to the U.S. In his role, uh, Ambassador al Oteba enhanced UAE-U.S. relations and improved bilateral security and economic cooperation. In addition to leading efforts that increased military, intelligence, and counterterrorism cooperation between the two countries, he also played a critical role in facilitating the landmark U.S.-UAE agreement for peaceful civilian nuclear energy cooperation, which came into force in 2009. He also worked closely with his government counterparts and business leaders to promote greater UAE-U.S. economic trade policies. Since becoming ambassador, bilateral trade increased over 70%, solidifying the UAE's position as the U.S.'s largest trading partner in the Middle East and North Africa. UAE investments in the U.S. expanded, and prominent U.S. healthcare, educational, cultural, cultural institutions, such as the Cleveland Clinic, New York University, and the Guggenheim established new UAE branches. Ambassador Ateba has also led the UAE's significant commitment to philanthropic activities in the U.S. Welcome, Ambassador, and thank you for being with us today. Um, so I, I thought we'd begin our, our conversation uh, by laying a bit of groundwork. Uh, you know, the UAE has led the regional entrepreneurship and venture capital funding for several years now, according to many reports. You know, what prompted the UAE to focus on driving entrepreneurship in the last few years? And, and what are you doing to ensure that momentum continues? Yeah, thanks, Samjad. I think we're about 20 years into a pretty deliberate, conscientious uh, strategy of diversifying away from oil and gas. Uh, it's something we decided on doing a while ago, and it has taken many forms and many initiatives over the 20 years. And we keep adapting to what the markets basically tell us. And I remember, I want to say it was about nine, ten years ago, a briefing we had in Abu Dhabi by Minister Girgawi, where he put up a slide and he showed us the five largest American companies maybe ten years ago, Coca-Cola, General Electric, um, uh, I can't remember the other few, but they were very, Exxon, yeah, they were companies that were great probably a decade prior. The biggest companies at the time, Microsoft, Google, Apple, Facebook, and, and another technology company. So at that moment, at least for me, it was pretty clear what the future was going to be. And again, if we were intent on diversifying away from oil and gas, we kind of have to bet on the future. The future is technology. You're seeing it today in traditional technology, and you're seeing it now with AI. So I think we're on the verge of a new, exciting sort of era in technology. But all of this basically means that we have to adapt, modify, adjust our system, our structure, our financing in order to meet not what's currently being addressed, not, not the current top five companies, but the top five companies and the top five sectors in the future. So I think the reason we are adapting our models is because, as, as, as I've heard Jeff Bezos once uh, say in a, publicly, so we're very big fans of leaning into the future. And I think leaning in the future requires the type of education, financing, capitalizing of, of the venture capital world. And, and it's many forms. Look, it's 2023. I don't know what that model is going to look like in 2025. But I think we're trying to keep up with where the future is taking us. No, I think that's a very valid point. I mean, we're seeing a lot of great reforms in the Middle East. Um, not only in the UAE, but other countries. But you, you hit on really an important matter, which is how do you change that culture and the mindset? Um, when you think about women specifically, what do you think we're going to need to do as, as not only the UAE, but I think this is true and endemic in the entire Middle East. 
what needs to be done to encourage more sort of risk taking in, in your opinion? I, I think it's definitely focusing on education because it starts with education and making sure our education system is preparing people to go out and be confident in taking a risk and doing a startup. Look, we are still a young country being risky uh, and going out on your own is not something culturally that is very popular. I think one of one of the questions I know we're going to discuss is uh, why aren't people more people going into entrepreneurship and private sector and innovation? And I think the short answer, Amjad, is we as a culture, we as a society, we still like prestige. We like the safety of going into government. We like the prestige of a big title, either in government or a company like Adnoc or Adya. And so taking a risk and starting a company that may or may not succeed, launching an app that may or may not succeed, is not something that I think is so core to our culture just yet, just yet. And I remember talking with my boss once and, and saying, the comment I made was, uh, we have to change this rule or we have to change this law or we have it. And he looked at me and smiled. And I said, why are you smiling? He said, because changing the rules or changing a law is the easiest thing we can do. We can change that overnight. He said, the part that takes longer and is a bit harder is changing the mindset and the attitude and the culture. And I think we are in the midst of changing that mindset. Yes, young people are now going more into entrepreneurship and innovation and, and willing to take risk, but that doesn't happen overnight. That's going to take some time, and our society has to welcome it and encouraging it and encourage it. We're still just not there yet. If you had to point to one or two policies that you thought really moved the needle for the UAE in terms of entrepreneurship, what would you say those are. I think we need to do two things. One is improve public-private partnership between governments and financial institutions, for example, or investment uh, investment businesses, uh, so that we as a government are creating the right rules and regulations and, and laws to help encourage and promote. But the government can't do everything. And if we over depend on the government, it kind of defeats the purpose of encouraging the private sector. So I think we have to figure out how to enhance public-private partnership with respect to the sector. The other thing is we just have to create more women-only funds, incubators, programs. And I think that's happening. I don't think it's happening enough. I know funding in general is hard even for young men now. It's not just a challenge for women. If you ask me, I think we need to encourage both sides, but I think sometimes families sometimes hold women back from moving forward. And I think we as a government, there's not, there's not much we can do on that end, but I think we have to create the right ecosystem and just allow you know, more encouragement, more risk-taking and more incentivizing uh, for women to enter that space. It, it's interesting you say that because actually in a few countries now, the government has done a better job than the private sector in increasing women at leadership positions, which is which is an interesting dynamic. Uh, the private sector is not catching up uh, to the speed that we'd like, at least. We did that early on. So, you know, we have nine women in the cabinet, right? Almost a third of our cabinet. We have 50% of our women in the parliament. Uh, that's higher than most Western countries. Um, we, are, we were the only Arab or the first Arab country to put a target and an objective for women on boards, on both public and private, where that women had to you know, be the equal number of men on boards. Most Western country, countries don't have that. So I think as a government, we are definitely forward leaning on this, definitely. And sometimes, yes, the private sector is a bit behind. How, how do you think we encourage the private sector to do more? I mean, can, can government play a role in encouraging the private sector in a way, maybe through policy? Fan of, I'm a big fan of incentivizing as opposed to punishing. So I think if the government comes up with incentives for women to enter these types of spaces, I think it's the right way to approach it. How, how exactly we do it, I, I think it's still a work in progress, but I'm a big fan of saying, if you do this, you'll re be rewarded with that. 
you, you hit on sort of preempting the next question, which is, you know, research shows that uh, almost 50% of female uh, business owners um, in the UAE face challenges raising capital. And uh, 80% of them use a lot of their own funding, uh, their own savings. Um, but you mentioned specifically maybe um, women-specific funds and, and things like that. Do, do you see the UAE government playing more of a role in bridging that funding gap, at least in the absolutely, interim? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely, because on stuff like this, I know my government pretty well. We're agnostic. We're totally agnostic. We want both men and women in this space. We want both men and women to take these types of risks. We want men and women to not depend on the government for everything. So I, I think we would apply that, you know, benchmark across the board. I, I'm noticing actually, and, and you know, I, as you know, I lived in the UAE for 17 years. Um, I, I noticed that more women um, in the, the um, large sovereign wealth fund area are coming into the finance field. Is that deliberate? Are, are you trying to get more women into the pipeline of becoming analysts and for Adia, for example, and Mubadala and, and the rest? Okay. Yeah, I, I think women women leading financing is really important for to fund women led startups. Um, be, before we head out, I, I wanted to give you sort of um, an, an open forum to to address our fellows if, if there was anything you'd like to say be, before leaving us. But uh, I'll, I'll let I'll leave the floor to you. Well, I see that there is a a very young member of the panel over there sitting down on the right-hand side. I don't know how old, yes, hi. I think we're taking early education to a completely different level. This is great. <laughs> um, I really just wanna encourage you to go out and do things that our parents probably would not have done. That, you know, sometimes, and I say this as a proud father of a 12-year-old and a 10-year-old, we grew up in a very different time. We grew up in a different age. We were very traditional. We were raised by traditional people in very traditional environments, even though I grew up in Egypt. We, you all are growing up at a time of incredible change, change that I think our minds cannot even grasp. I was just in a conference, and I just came back two days ago, and Sam Altman from OpenAI was on a panel. And I swear, my mind cannot grasp where I think AI may take us. And so I am trying to be, as a 50-year-old, I'm trying to be as open-minded as, open as possible about what the future holds. Um, the options are infinite. The way the world is going to change is going to blow your minds. Be willing to take risks, even as others discouraging you from doing so, just because it's not our style or not our culture or not our history, but I think the greatest things that will happen in the next 10, 20 years are going to come from technologies we barely understand right now, that we barely know about right now. Diseases will be cured. Things will be addressed that, you know, we're struggling to address. So I say this as a, as an older person now, <laughs> please keep an open mind about the future and don't be afraid to take some risks. And we as a country will provide as much as possible in terms of insurance and protection and safety nets. But you're the ones who are really gonna do it, not us. Well, Ambassador, as always, uh, we appreciate your generosity uh, in speaking with us uh, and supporting the Wind Fellowship and, and other things that the Empower Middle East Initiative does. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. It's very nice to meet you all. All right, take care, bye-bye. Um, and now I'd like to introduce my colleague, uh, Lynn Munzer, Associate Director for the Wind Fellowship with the Empower Middle East Initiative, who will be moderating the panel. Uh, Lynn has spent her entire career focusing on improving women's lives in the MENA region uh, by increasing their labor force participation and fostering female-led partnership, uh, entrepreneurship, I should say. Uh, in fact, she holds a PhD focused on female entrepreneurship in the MENA region. Um, she was previously a lead researcher analyst at the Wilson Center's Middle East program and worked to identify policy gaps that contribute to low women's economic participation and entrepreneurship. Over to you, Lynn. Thank you so much, Amjad. And um, hello, everyone. 
uh, we we did have a chat before we start. Um, today we are privileged to have exceptional panel, including I will just do the quick introduction. Alifia Doriwala, the co-chief investment officer at Rock Creek. Hi, Alifia. She's joining us virtually. Huda Lawati, she's the founder and CEO of Alif Capital. She's joining us in person. And we have Zahra Zayat. I hope I didn't butcher the names. She's the chief commercial officer at the end. Thank you all for your time and for, jo for joining us for this conversation. I will start with our panelists to just kickstart the conversation and get the ball rolling. So Alifia, first I'll start with you. With Rock Creek's equality fund portfolio utilizing 100% gender lesson investing in both the private and public companies, tell us more about how, why first you chose this specific investment strategy. Second, give us an example of some positive outcomes you've observed uh, from this. And what are the trends and the patterns uh, in the investment that you found? Thank you so much, Lynn, and it's so wonderful to be have a chance to meet all of you and, and hear all of the wonderful initiatives that you are working on. Um, just maybe a little bit of background. The Equality Fund is one of our portfolios. Rock Creek is an asset management firm based in Washington, D.C., and we invest over $15 billion. Um, and over our 20-year life cycle, we've actually put over $1.2 billion to work in women entrepreneurs, as well as women-founded venture funds and other um, investment funds. Funds. And so uh, we're a woman-owned asset management firm, which is also quite rare in the finance space. And so when the Equality Fund, um, which I'll explain, came about, it was very much mission aligned with how we invest and how we want to continue investing for the future. So the Equality Fund is a $300 million mandate by the Canadian government. And it is one of the first of its kind. And the goal for the Canadian government was to actually take money that had been grant money and use it towards a return investment strategy. So they wanted to mobilize more capital towards female entrepreneurs, towards fund managers, and towards businesses and services that target women. And it was really one of the first of its kind at this scale to have a, an explicit 100% gender lens focus. So again, we have two objectives. One is return and the second is impact. And um, we are very passionate that if anybody says you can't do both, we would argue and we would show you a lot of data that shows that that is completely false. But that is something that people tend to, especially large investors, tend to fall back on, right? That you can't make return and do good in the world and advance gender equity. Uh, this portfolio is really meant to be able to focus on showing investors how you can do that and on also multiplying the number of investment opportunities out there if you want to invest with a gender lens focus. So Lynn, to your question in terms of one or, what is one of the specific outcomes that have come, um, come about from this type of portfolio, uh, we have actually created more funds, more products that are gender lens focused that did not exist for investors prior to this mandate. So for example, you would think that in North America, which is actually, I would say, quite backwards compared to the rest of the world in terms of women um, funding, you would think that there were lots of funds out there that were targeting debt financing, specifically debt financing, towards women entrepreneurs, because they do not have the same access to traditional capital that, quite frankly, you would have if you were very networked and you were in this space. There weren't, there weren't any types of products. So we created a private debt strategy that specifically targets debt financing for women entrepreneurs in North America that don't have otherwise easy access to, to traditional capital. And that fund is generating an eight to 10% return completely um, in line with any of its peers today. So one of the specific outcomes from something like an equality fund that the government supported in Canada is really being able to expand the number of investment opportunities if you really want to focus on advancing gender equity. Okay, thank you. I want to go to you, Huda. Um, as a, a female founder and a CEO uh, in the private equity industry, can you share a few specific challenges you faced in the UAE? How do you, do you navigate through them? And what's your experience uh, influence how Alif Capital's investment strategy goes and how the operation goes? So as a, as a, I don't want to say the female founder, but 
now because we're discussing the topic specifically as a female founder we'd love to learn more about your experience my private equity fund uh, two years a little under two years ago i've been in the investment corporate sector for 20 years uh, i started in corporate but was in private equity for 12 years then corporate three years back to private equity um, I, I decided that it was time, to, and it, it actually leverages a lot of his excellencies that given what our governments are doing and the commitment they have to the diversification of our uh, resources and our income as a region, I saw a great opportunity to actually start something. And so I started a private equity fund, and I have been backed by my, my anchor investor is actually in Abu Dhabi based sovereign. I'm incorporated here in the ADGM. Uh, and I would say that what what, um, what was said earlier, I, I, I echo a lot that to a large extent today in our markets, the government is actually way ahead in terms of supporting and encouraging female participation compared to the private sector. My funding, and we're, 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 you know, we're more than halfway mark on our uh, fundraising, almost two thirds, and most of it came from sovereign wealth funds across the region. A small percentage came from private sector, which is a big funder of asset management globally. In fact, this region puts a lot of money to work globally, uh, which is one of the reasons I wanted to found something here, because we don't have that many asset managers. But in the private sector, you actually see a little bit more um, hesitation. And I think it comes from the decisive nature of the leadership in the government that they sort of say that we need to make this happen. We need to increase similar participation. And they, and they, they really try to be as agnostic as possible. Um, but obviously there are challenges. Um, obviously I run a fund, so I invest in businesses, but I also am a founder because it's a new company. And uh, I think uh, one thing I've spoken about a lot, I look very early on, about 10 years ago, I wrote an article about challenges for startups and people making a decision to start a business. I think there are three key challenges that are you know, prevalent in our region. One is obviously the cultural element that His Excellency talked about, so I won't elaborate on that. The second is education. Our education system has historically not encouraged people to take risk. They've encouraged people to be safe. I think they've not, you know, we, I did a few of these programs um, uh, uh, where you go in and talk to 11th graders and 12th graders about entrepreneurship, try to do a project with them. And I was surprised to find that at this age, where in, you know, in Europe or US, you would have uh, kids who are running little corporates at home or being very uh, focused on uh, uh, transactions, there was very little understanding of what entrepreneurship means and what it takes and what kind of, not just risk, but also responsibility that comes with it. So I think education, including at home, is a very big part. But there's an also, I think that there's, there's a regulatory element that I find, um, it, it's been uh, improved over time, but definitely our, um, uh, insolvency and bankruptcy laws, the risk of doing business and failing can be uh, uh, sort of uh, increased a lot in, in, in a market where the bankruptcy insolvency laws are not as developed. Uh, I think there have been lots of improvement, but there's still a lot of work. So that's sort of my view on what needs to be done. Personally, the challenge I face is usually with um, private businesses when I'm fundraising. Um, in, in the colloquial uh, cigar room and boys club in the, in the Western is equated here with majlises and, and uh, shisha, mm -hmm. if I can say. And, and you, miss out on to, you miss out on certain fundraising opportunities. You miss out on creating that rapport, which allows people to write checks when you're a first time manager. Uh, and sometimes you miss, it, uh, miss out on decision making and on uh, business operational decisions or strat strategic decision because you are not in that room either because you're not invited or frankly some because you don't want to be as well to some extent so i think these are challenges the best um, uh, response to this challenge is in numbers 70 percent of graduates being women uh, from colleges us the ratios are also not great college going women you know are almost 2x uh, college going men i think We've invested a lot in, in female participation, but I think this force of numbers that is coming our way with the education system is going to serve us very well. Uh, in the meantime, what people like me can do, because as a fund, you have a multiplier effect, I think, uh, and, and Rock Creek kind of uh, translates that into action. But what happens is that when we invest in multiple businesses, in my fund, I'm going to do 10, 12 investments. I sit on boards, I sit on other boards as, we, as an independent as well. I always ask about what is, 
how many women, not only how many women do you employ, but how many women in management, not just how many women, how many mothers. And I think all of these things are very, very important uh, if you want to increase participation. And I think if I'm honest, our region, some of the least, I would say, uh, rude words where men speak over you or you are unheard are actually sometimes in our region. And, and I don't know if anybody else has this opinion, but when I was I was uh, the chief investment officer of a large conglomerate in Saudi, the Vola, I would tell you that it's probably the most respectful board I've uh, I've been in, and I think it's partly to do with the fact that we're somewhat hierarchical, so that I have the chief investment of, uh, officer position, so it will be given its respect. But really, I actually think we have some advantages here as well. Yeah, definitely. And I think a lot of the uh, the fellows in the room are nodding because especially when we talk about the men's men's group, men's club, we hear that a lot. Not just I heard it from the fellows. I heard I read it in my research. I did it. It's all over the place. And creating a network that for women who support women, that's that's important for the growth of women in general and women entrepreneurs specifically. Zahra, I will go to you. In your role as the CCO at EN Life, what is the status of women in your industry today? And how has it changed in the last few years? Because we've seen a lot of change. I want to see your perspective. Do you see that? Can you like highlight some specific experiences or trends that are demonstrating the gender gap in the UAE right now? Uh, I think, to be honest with you, we've evolved a lot, uh, specifically in the in the most recent years. Um, I don't see gender gap in the way it's it's being described as as women are, uh, you know, the 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 weak party here. In fact, I see a lot of opportunities that have been created for women, uh, especially in in most recent years. Um, uh, women have a voice. Uh, and a voice that is loud and clear in boardrooms, in investment committees, um, in 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 funding rounds. I I do believe that, and I see it in our investment strategy. So we've got an arm which is E and Capital, uh, which is which is a VC fund that we've created. We've got also our M and A arm that focuses on larger investments. And some of the key criteria we look at objectively and. For me personally, when we look objectively and as a company, we look into certain criteria when we're assessing um, uh, either an acquisition of a company or funding a startup. So a few of the criteria that we look at are the team, team stamina, uh, uh, founder, co-founder, uh, capabilities, prior experience, etc. So that's on the team side. And then we look into the industry side, whether this is an industry that is high growing um, and 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 uh, will generate the right multiples that we're looking for. And we also look into whether this fits our strategic objectives as a company. But one of the key areas that we look at, which will improve the overall scoring on whether we should put money in that company or not, is sustainability and diversity and here we focus on on inclusion of women this wasn't the case before but it is the case now and it's part of the scoring um, uh, that that we put together in order to um, decide on whether we move forward with that investment or not to to our investment committee so overall it's the scoring that that would decide on 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 whether we move forward and here we're objectively looking into the company now I'm not saying that there is no uh, uh, sort of um, unconscious bias, um, especially that the majority of the VCs and and VC and and partners running VCs are are mainly uh, males and 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 men. We we see very rarely that VCs are uh, run by by women, unfortunately. But that's that's the state of our industry and and that's the situation. 
Uh, yet it doesn't mean that women are 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 not given a chance. Uh, what what I have seen personally is that we receive a lot of pitches, a lot of pitch decks related to startups, but um, uh, I haven't seen a lot of women um, uh, looking for 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 funding, looking for money at least on our side when when people are 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 pitching their 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 startups, and this is very very unfortunate. It's either uh, related to uh, to to the specific um, uh, instance highlighted by by our colleague here, that women sometimes uh, do not have the right networking opportunities, participating in the majlis, uh, playing on the golf courses of 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 the UAE. So a lot of women do not have this network opportunity of of knowing the person who knows the person who knows the right person to put them in touch uh, with 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 the right company or or the right people, unfortunately. And and by not having that opportunity, women are missing out a lot, reaching to the right people and getting the right funding uh, for their businesses. Um, um so 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 that's on which which will cause less women participation and and less women being pushed into into successful uh funding of of their startups but i think there is also another side of the of the story which is uh, the risk appetite of women if you go to to us and other parts of the world when 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 a student graduates whether it's a male or a female they're under pressure to start their own business to become entrepreneurs in our region unfortunately you're under pressure to become an employee to have a salary job which is a completely different kind of pressure that we have here so women are 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 structured in a way unfortunately to 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 finish their education either become housewives or find a salary job and then on top of that um uh they 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 lose a lot of the opportunity to become uh, risk takers by definition and structurally you would see a lot of women um saving their salaries in bank accounts less men do that. So women get their salaries, they put it in a bank account, they put it in a safe, they put it on the side. They don't take risk. They don't take it, invest it in 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 real estate and in, in, in funding their own businesses, etc. So this has to do also with the risk appetite and with the financial literacy that uh, women have been exposed to throughout their up upbringing. And uh, I would echo uh, Yusuf, actually, he's mentioned that. He said, I would encourage you to raise your kids in a different way. Financial literacy and risk taking are, are two very important uh, areas that we need to focus on raising our, our, our women and, and our kids. Throughout the region, we have a high number of women graduating from university colleges having higher degrees than men. However, the education system is not up to date and is not, it does not like motivate women to start or teach women how to, or even women and men to start, to be entrepreneurs, to start a business, to think beyond what's safe, what's good. That's one thing. Also, the, we, also we mentioned the, the men's club, that's definitely it. And um, it's maybe the fear of failure. One of the research showed that there is, a, especially in UAE, there's a high fear of failure, and that's why women do not go into uh, starting a business. So they're afraid, so they don't take action. And the, I would I see the same thing in funding. Even women entrepreneurs, they're afraid of going into a room and being afraid of being afraid of all men who won't understand their business or what they're providing, especially if they're femtech products or any product that they, that especially because most uh, VCs are man-led, or people who graduated with this, from the same university with the same ideas, with the same objectives. So you don't have diversity on board, even if you have few women uh, on it. So thank you so much. I'll go back to you, Alicia. I think th this conversation is amazing. We're talking about your experience with what's going on in the US, with what's going on in UAE and the whole region. 
uh, I want to go back to when it comes to women specific programs. What have been some unique strategies or approach that you found very impactful in promoting gender equity in uh, venture funding? And like on the other hand, can what are the 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 specific aspects of these initi initiatives that doesn't give the right result of the result we expect for. And maybe the, we can learn uh, some of it to apply it in the region. Yeah, thank you. No, it's very interesting and all the comments I um, found very interesting. I think in terms of what we have seen, um, and this was, ec I echo exactly what um, Huda said, our research has found that the more females you have in top GP positions at venture funds, the more funding will go towards women entrepreneurs. And they don't have to have an explicit mandate. But like you said, Lynn, if you have a gender balanced team that an entrepreneur is going to pitch at, you have 50% chance that somebody there will connect with you. And as we all know, with venture funding, you haven't made $1 when you go to ask for a dollar. So it is about relationship. It is about networking. That is the entire essence of what venture funding is. That's different than growth. That's different than other stages of investment. But that is so important. And what we have found is that the more women or the more gender balance you have, the more um, trickle down effect you have. And it is critical to promoting more funding in to women entrepreneurs in the venture world to have more GPs that are women. And I don't mean just at small funds. I mean at the largest funds. I think what happens is women get pigeonholed and it's great. You can start a fund at let's say 20 million here in the US. And there was a period of time over the last couple of years where we actually saw a high number of women getting funded at the venture fund level. And again, I think that trickles down to the number of entrepreneurs that they will have in their portfolios that are women. But but then they stop at a small scale. Why shouldn't mm. there be a women-owned Blackstone or a Carlisle or the largest private equity firms out there? Because that is the only way that women will continue to grow. I think one of the things that we've noticed here in the U.S., which you could argue is maybe a little bit further ahead in thinking about some of these areas in terms of women-led um, firms in the venture funding space, is that the capital stops there. So now you have women entrepreneurs that have proven that they have an idea, they've gotten venture funding, they've gotten accelerator capital, but then there's no growth capital for those women entrepreneurs. Mm. So, you know, then you, again, you don't get scale. And I think one of the things that is holding women back globally is that we don't have the scale. And I think it is part of sometimes a women's psyche. You think smaller rather than bigger. A guy will go into a room and ask for a billion dollars. A woman might go in and ask for a hundred million for the exact same idea. And that is just something that I think is you know, part of the issue, but I think part of the issue is that women also don't tend to want to work at those larger firms because they are one of the only women. And so it's part of the entire ecosystem of really needing more thoughtful investments by larger institutional allocators, both towards venture funds that are, again, balanced in terms of their GPs, as well as a pipeline of growing women entrepreneurship. And I found that conversation interesting because I think I take for granted here in the US the amount of innovation in our education system, as much as we talk about the drawbacks here, I think that is something that we have seen. But part of it is because a lot of the universities here really promote that innovation while kids are in school. So we work with many university endowments. We manage their money. They all have these incubators where if you have an idea as a junior or senior in undergrad, you you can go and get a little bit of funding or just have a lab where you can test your ideas, right? And then think about the amount of academic um, intellect that is at a university. That all promotes innovation. So universities really need to create that environment at a very early age because that's then where accelerators will go to to start looking mm -hmm. for sourcing. And that's where then venture funds go to. So it's an entire, I think, chain that really does start also at the pipeline of having more women want to become entrepreneurs. I think the idea of having that start at a university, which is what we have here, everybody graduating from Stanford, 99% of them, the first thing they do is try and do a startup. They don't go into investment banking or consulting like that was the usual traditional path. They all try startup. 99% of them will fail, by the way. That's not that's not necessarily the, the point, right? But they all yeah. try. 
And that's because of the environment that I think has been created at the university level. But I think that um, what we have seen in terms of programs is you need accelerator programs that are very much intentional in terms of promoting gender equity. And you really need programs that increase the pipeline of women talent at every stage, venture, growth, buyout, because otherwise you'll never get women to become um, at scale in terms of what they need. Yeah, I, I see my friend's kid who's 12 years old was asking me for money the other day. I told her why. She said, I'm starting a business at my school and we need funders. So <laughs> it's interesting to see uh, she's based in, in D.C. So uh, it's interesting to see like the shift in the education system. We, st we see it a bit in the region, but not enough. So there is a lot of work to be done there. Um, I'll go I'll go back uh, to you, Huda. What is like? Can you tell us more about like the strategies that or any initiative that uh, Alive Capital has implemented to bridge this gender gap by uh, by private capitals? Is obviously I think by virtue of we being women, me and my head of investments are are, are both women. Uh, we don't have the unconscious bias. I think we've already crossed a big hurdle there because unconscious bias is huge. I actually studied neuroscience in college, and I'll tell you that it's not like there's a whole evil army of men standing there, and, you know, saying you need to stay out. It's it's not that. A lot of it is unconscious. Um, some is because of culture. Some is because of what they're used to. There's an interesting, there's a gentleman I, I work with a lot in my consumer businesses, and he founded one of the early data analytic businesses in, in uh, UK, uh, Dan Humby. It's uh, uh, Clive Humby. And today he sits on the AI ethics board for the United Kingdom. And he told me something very interesting. He said, I, I said, well, what is, this is about four years ago before AI was a big thing. I said, well, what does AI ethics exactly mean? He said, well, if I were to ask AI to pick a woman to run a fund, you'll be the last person on the list. Of course, I was very offended by this. And I said, but why? He said, because AI looks at historical data. Mm -hmm. Historical data says that men will manage good funds. There's no not, not enough data that says otherwise, right? Uh, and so you have to first correct for that, and then you have to correct for the people who are writing the algorithms and who might have their own biases that build, they build into the algorithms. So um, I think that made me realize how big a unconscious bias is, and two how big an impact history has on things, and what what little data we have. So I think one thing we do a lot of is try to put data out there. Uh, you know, uh, performance of publicly listed companies that have women uh, board members or women management. Members. There's a lot of data. McKinsey is a big uh, region of data. HBS has a lot of data. You will find that there's a lot of data that demonstrates the the impact, the positive impact of having women in the room and on the job, so we use mm -hmm. that a lot. Um, we track, uh, so our uh, part of our, the scoreboard that we set for our CEOs when they report into us is uh, our, our uh, certain KPIs, including their uh, improvement, not just metrics, on gender. So the first business that we bought in out of our, our fund was a, the, it's a leading pet business out of the UAE. It had zero women in the management team. Uh, and so, it, you know, their CTO today is a woman. Uh, yeah. We're looking, to, they, they want to hire uh, another C-level position, and we've sort of said, we're not going to approve it unless you, we don't say that you have to hire women, because we think that that can go in negative direction very quickly. But what we say is that you have to demonstrate to us that you had an open funnel that was very, very unbiased at the beginning. And then, of course, everything else needs to come into effect. So we do that a lot. And I think finally, the, the other thing that we uh, we do is we have sort of our own community engagement programs and uh, we're young, but as individuals, we do participate in you know uh, uh, events such as these that are women oriented. And to the extent possible, myself, my other uh, team members, we mentor women, we make connections, we try to help them network. Uh, I have a few friends who work in banking myself. We always do dinners and drinks where we invite people who we know, investors, et cetera, and then founders that we know and try to just connect dots. Amazing. Um, yeah, that's like, you, at, like, at least you're trying to move the needle to change the, the conversation. And and bias in technology is very high, especially in AI. Uh, it's the people who's writing it who, are, who have these unconscious biases, and it goes right into the technology. So uh, this is where uh, I go to use Zahra. 
uh, giving EN and EN lives their focus on technology. Could you share how uh, the technological advancement and digital solutions are being used to foster female entrepreneurship? And did you see any increase in uh, women-led businesses due of that, due to that? Yeah, definitely. As as I've highlighted, we've seen a lot of positive change in the in the in the past uh, few years. Uh, simply uh, simply because uh, I think st structurally uh, the region has changed. So women now have have more examples to look up to, uh, where historically it was restricted to the pool of of women that they are surrounded with now. Uh, women can see uh, great examples from around the world, great success stories of women starting and exiting uh, uh, businesses, um, making huge returns, um, talking about financial independence, etc. So, so putting those uh, role models and examples in the in the face of of women definitely has uplifted and and. Uh, uh, upscale the overall capabilities of of women in the in the region, but also you know with 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 the digital products that we have and the overall digital transformation. Um, uh, this has eliminated a lot of the restrictions that women used to have, given that they have to take care of their home, and and they've got they've got a full time job and so on. Women can now run their own businesses from the comfort of their home, and through the internet, through e commerce, we've seen a lot of um, uh, women now managing starting their own businesses from home. Um, uh, whether whether it's it's a skill as simple as as cooking to uh, to actual uh, coaching, we've seen that we've seen a lot of women coaches rising now in the region and and doing their coaching sessions online, starting their businesses online and and growing their businesses. We've seen also women. Uh, one of the most successful exits in the past two years was by women in the in the region mom's world and and also started uh, by by women entrepreneurs so 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 this has never been the case in the in the region before but obviously the the flexibility of the digital products that are uh, flourishing uh, around has has allowed many women to to think about starting their own businesses to think about how to scale uh, those businesses and also how to take it globally uh, with a with a flexibility and and the simplicity that uh, that the internet and 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 the global ecosystem provides. Good. No, that's great. And um, I will stay with you because we. I want to give you the final um, final words, final question for everyone. Um, we want what do we what we what we want to take actionable steps from this session. So, what do you recommend uh, that whether investors, policymaker, or even corporate leaders can take can make or do to encourage and support more female uh, entrepreneurs and ventures in the in the UAE? Yeah, um, education, education, education. I can't stress enough on that. And um, having uh, allowing women to have access to to education in the same way males have access to education is is really important and crucial. That's one. Two, uh, uh, a seat on the table uh, on boards on company boards. Um, We've seen we've seen men serving on the boards for 10 and 20 years, and that's just how it's designed. I think it's important to replenish those board members, um, uh, enforce or force uh, an expiry date for 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 that tenor, uh, and allow um, more women to participate on on boards. I think this will improve the overall ecosystem to support women in the workspace and also women 
entrepreneurs. Um, uh, these are two uh, important uh, things from a policymaker and also culturally that 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 got to change. Thank you, Zahra. Huda, any suggestions? Oh, we can't hear you. Yet. I think there's a mix of things at the at the at the base level. I think it's really families and uh, individuals. I think one of the most impactful things in my life has been my parents. Uh, uh, I grew up in Oman. I'm from Oman, and the, the, I was in a culture where a lot of what I was doing or what I was allowed to do, let's say, you know, go study outside. I want to go work in Dubai were things that were not allowed as necessarily for girls. But my parents made an effort to, you know, protect us against the overall culture and say, no, you should, you know, uh, uh, forge your own path and you should do where you, things that where you have passion, where you have interest. And so I think that's hugely important for families, individuals, how we bring up our children, how we, uh, uh, and it goes to education in schools and it goes to uh, uh, exposure. But I think that's extremely important. Um, and all, all, all the way on the other end, obviously, when it comes to policy, I think there's a lot that's being done well. Uh, uh, you know, UAE mandates female participation on, on public company boards. Uh, I think the, 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 the enforcement of that, the continuity of that. The reality is that I've been on boards uh, in private equity, you end up being on boards early in your career. So I've been on boards for very, very long. Um, I, I think that when you are on a board as a single woman, it's harder. There's this critical mass. They say three women in a room, but whatever it is, it usually is there. In the meantime, I think we all have to make an effort to be very um, sometimes uh, blatant. I, I always mm. tell people, you know, take the head chair in a room, be thick skinned, be a bit loud. It's OK. But I think building that culture where women are both, you know, all the way government, corporate, home, where women have that even over confidence is not a bad thing. We needed to just get the women's voice out there. I definitely encourage women to develop a thick skin, be a bit loud. It's okay if some people find you aggressive, they'll get over it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Alicia, any last notes? Yes, thank you. I would just say two things. One, in terms of the pipeline, and that goes back to education, which has been covered. I would also encourage um, the po on the policy side, you know, there's large, very large pools of institutional capital, allocator capital. And for them to give capital to um, women, you know, they're not taking a risk. It's always sometimes perceived as a risk. It's not a risk if you look at that. And I think what it sounds like there are being steps made in this direction, but you have to put the data out there then. So if these large pools of capital are giving more funding to women, they then need to give put out the data, show that it has generated returns. Because in the mm -hmm. end, this is all about making money, right? And you don't want charity. You're not asking for a handout. You're asking for capital so that you can build a business that is profitable, that contributes to the economy. So the more data you show and that these pools of capital can show, then more investors will follow. And that's what I think you really need. And the last thing I'll say, because I know there's a lot of entrepreneurs in the room, is that be very smart about how you approach allocators. Think about who you want to approach first. Think about who you want to practice on, because it'll be, you know, you'll do your pitch 10 times, and then the 11th time will be that one time where you're in front of the right person and the pitch is perfect. Don't go to that perfect person you want to invest first. I think there's just a whole um, psychology around how you go about pitching and how you go about venture um, capital raising that is very important that women I don't think necessarily get as much experience with throughout their careers or mentorship on. Yeah, it's unfortunately we don't have time for Q and A's, but I know you're you're all in the room. You can keep the conversation going and you have our contact details. You can contact us anytime, whether virtually or the participant virtually or in person, it's apparent from our conversation that we have a collective responsibility to eliminate the gender gap in funding, whether it's venture, fund, fund, venture funding or any sort of funding and promote equality in all sec sectors. So uh, at the end, I want to thank you once again, uh, Dalia Uden and Ambassador Rotaiba for, and for our panelists for your contributions. I'd also like to thank uh, Lana Ayash from the US Embassy in the UAE, as well as Mahal uh, Mazrui. I hope I didn't butcher the family name, Sinara Jimenez. Thank you all from ADGM for helping us make this come true. And 
Last but not least, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, it was a great conversation, and I hope you'll benefit from it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all.